Hello, everybody. Can anybody hear me? Yes. Yes, it's yes. from everybody. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> very good, very good. And uh, okay, then let's let's go ahead. Today we are talking about we have a one hour session on on uh, DHS two research. And let me please uh, share a screen. Ah, you cannot start screen sharing while the other participant is sharing. Oh, I'll stop sharing that now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. I am now sharing a screen. No? Uh, try now. No, I try. Yes, let me see with my PowerPoint. Yes. Can you see me now? Uh, not yet. Do you want to try again for me? Not seeing you, Jorn. Are clicking on share screen. You, you are invisible. Always invisible. Uh, I'm clicking on the share screen uh, feature. Okay, what do you see? I see uh, probably your screen or something. Now we have an expert here. So you should have ah. a window with lots of, um, with all the ah, windows going. I am. There we go. Can you see me now? Can indeed. Okay. Well, we have some uh, technicalities, but uh, from the beginning, this is, this is, can you now see everything? You are visible, Jorn. That's very, very, very fine. So uh, today's session is uh, about uh, research on, on uh, DHS2 and health information systems. And we have <clears throat> four presentations from, say, typical uh, uh, research cases or from typical uh, field cases from the DHS2 uh, world. And uh, what is the topic is then how to turn uh, what we normally see as uh, project and field work into research that's that's the topic of today's session and how to best study dhs2 and his action and impact so uh, the problem is often that uh, it's difficult to know exactly exactly what are what are the data how to turn it into research and all this is part of a project to develop case studies case stories and research on the various avenues of the dhis2 and hisp uh, research and projects and we call that uh, the dhis2 and hisp evaluation and documentation project we call it the heritage project so the point is to document where we are now and where we are going and where we have been. So many masters and PhD students have done their research in the DHS2 and the HISP uh, ecosystem. And uh, fieldwork has been carried out in many, many low and middle income countries. And uh, what is often a bit complicated is to turn this uh, say case case work uh, field studies into research what what is the difference what is the difference between research and project work in this these uh, cases and how do you document and learn from these various activities whether it's uh, uh, field work in uh, mozambique it's uh, field work in indonesia it's field work in india and field work in norway how do we lift uh, learning and empirical data from these uh, projects to become a research article. So when we talk about investigation, research is about investigation. What do we want to find out? What is the case narrative and research perspective? What 
what is kind of one thing i mean to to, to turn everything into something that can be uh, written up as research in a academic journal or conference the research perspective sometimes it's important then to have an analytical framework some theories to use etc so these are the things we are going to discuss today and further on within this project we call heritage project or documentation project today we have four presentations that's for example so case studies case study research first is first out is uh, implementation of the hs2 for immunization in indonesia one problem here is how do you implement systems when you have a uh, lockdown and uh, not able to move around? Data use and DHS to use for data use in Mozambique. And how, and the, the third one is uh, documentation of data handling and DHS to use in Odisha, India. And finally, there will be a presentation on the COVID 19 responses in Norway. So, and I suggest that uh, Lisa and Google is, is uh, turning on their screen sharing and start uh, presenting and I will then stop share like this. Please take over Indonesia team. Okay, thank you Jörn. I'm trying to share my screen here. Okay, can everyone see my screen? Yes, go ahead. Okay. Okay, thank you for the time. So, um, yes, as Jörn has uh, introduced, so our title, um, we pick a little bit different title than what Jörn has said. So this title uh, is Information Systems Action Research in COVID-19 Time. Um, this is our experience of implementing DHS2 for immunization in Indonesia. And in this session, we would like to present how we navigate our action research in COVID time and how this experience may contribute to DHS2 research landscape. Here, uh, I have my partner, Gordian Sanjaya from Universitas Gajah Mada, or UGM, who has been a partner of DHS2 implementation in Indonesia since 2011. So, um, yeah, next. Okay, so the immunization program of the Indonesia Ministry of Health um, has been using Excel data sheets for data collection and the management of its aggregate immunization data for the last decades. Um, and this has potential serious flaws to the data quality and the management. Therefore, uh, the immunization program wishes to shift to DHS2, which has been used by the Ministry of Health to integrate data. Um, and then also we have a One Health Data Policy in Indonesia using the same platform, which is DHS2. So what we're doing here is we are standardizing reporting form, and then we're aiming for a longer term integrated uh, data warehouse. One of the key activities uh, that we're doing is capacity building, because as you can see here, we want to move from um, Excel into DHS2 and then from there we want them to be able to use the dashboards uh, which is a standard dashboards and also uh, to improve their data quality and then also assisting uh, their monitoring program. Um, so this capacity building part is actually a part of my PhD research project or more focus of my PhD research project, and we implement this project following an action research cycle. So this is the timeline. Um, we started our project for this immunization program late in 2019. Um, we started with assessment, and from the assessment result, we decided to start by doing a pilot project in DKI Jakarta. Uh, province, which is uh, where the country Kabul is lying now, and uh, no, not end, but but uh, during the process, the COVID-19 pandemic started to affect the country. We started to report our first cases, and then uh, the country started to enact. Uh, several local governments started to enact um, large social scale, large scale social restrictions. It's very mouthful. 
Um, but this is not the lockdown, but still it restricts a lot of travel from in and out of the country and also um, domestically. So uh, because we, we have team members in three cities in Oslo, Norway, and then also in Jakarta, uh, Indonesia and Yogyakarta, Indonesia, um, we hardly seen each other since the start of the pandemic. So we started to pivot our strategy into online action, which includes um, online planning, online meeting, and online training. And also um, here, as you can see, we also experienced uh, management rotation in May. And then um, to date, uh, we have tested some of our instructional designs, speaking about capacity building, uh, to the pilot province two days ago. So although this pilot project has started several months ago, but just two days ago, we had this testing. And then we will start doing our training for the trainer tomorrow using the new style of capacity building, which is online, fully online. So uh, to date, our intervention um, employs strategies that are adaptive to the changes uh, caused by the pandemic. And this includes a research project management strategy uh, where we have a couple of weekly or biweekly online meetings via Zoom and um, we are networking and collaborating together in document development, uh, maximizing the use of Google Drive and also um, we are um, after the post after the pilot project we are implementing a cascade training model that's why we're doing the training for trainer tomorrow 25th of September um, and then uh, what's so uh, specific about this project is that we are closely collaborating with MOH so our MOH counterpart is highly involved in this project all the planning and all the implementation we are involving them and they are very uh, concerned with all of all this project and also excited because um, this is very new to them but they have a big hope for this project too and then also instead of doing the um, the training fully synchronous in a fully synchronous session uh, we are setting up a full LMS using um, Moodle learning management system. So we have pre-recorded videos for all the materials that we are going to def um, deliver to our um, participants. And also we have all different activities to enrich our capacity building, which includes assignments, slides, quizzes, etc. And um, these quizzes are supposed to help us um, looking at which participants are the potential trainer for the next trainings. And here we have been doing a meticulous planning, um, planning and uh, for both asynchronous and synchronization because we're going to train them in a very limited time. And um, we don't want to uh, mess with the schedule because they're already tired with all of these online meetings every day. So we are supporting through WhatsApp group and also, we have evaluation strategy through interviews, surveys, and all this that you can see here. And then lastly, sorry. And then lastly, um, we have some issues that we are considering. So to some extent, managing um, online project um, might not be a unique um, experience, except that now this is our only option. Um, we, it is imperative that we are using this strategy and most people in the project are um, working at home uh, which gives additional challenges. Some people are really forced to do this um, so maybe they don't really like talking through, um, through a laptop or but now they have to do it. So here um, in the research aspect we are also challenging existing institution of what we call traditional implementation. And there are several familiar aspects to our people um, in the implementation that change. For example, per diem, they cannot get it anymore because they're not traveling anywhere. And then also social interaction with peers, it's lost now, um, or in different way. And then accountability partners, face-to-face -face discussion, and now they have to have their kids running around them while they're trying to even enter Zoom meeting or share their screen, like what I experienced. And um, we hope through this research, uh, we would contribute to at least two things. First, the practice 
uh, through the notion of adaptive project management. And the second, the methods of action research with the notion of adaptive action research. Thank you. Thank you, Jorn. I'm returning this to you. Very good. And now, uh, next one takes over. Nilsa and Seferino. Yes. I'm yes. Starting. Go ahead. Go ahead, Nilsa. Share. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for the time. I think everyone can see my screen now. Perfect. Yes. Um, I'll start by uh, presenting the, the team that is here with me. I'm Nilza Collinson. Uh, I'm with uh, Zeferino Saujen and Emilio Moss. We are from the University of Eduardo Mondlane, and I'm a, the, one of the PhD students that are involved in this project. Uh, so uh, I'm starting presenting our case, uh, just giving a brief of uh, what we have been doing on the last two decades. Uh, so our project in Mozambique started uh, around 2000 uh, and it started in three provinces and uh, it was at the moment uh, in, uh, with the involvement as well with, of the, the PhD program uh, in Norway. So we had some uh, researchers involved in this and uh, the project initiated, but it wasn't uh, very much um, uh, followed up. Followed up, and only in 2016, it was a uh, uh, DHIS2 was adopted national national wide, and uh, in different programs, uh, and it's still following some of the vertical pro programs that we have in the uh, health information system in Mozambique. During this period, we had several PhD students, now researchers that are trainees on the master program that we already uh, started uh, during this period. We have several programs in uh, informatics and uh, medical uh, uh, master programs. And uh, we, we have already implemented uh, academies that are running programs locally and regional uh, within the Lusophony uh, countries. Uh, during these two de decades, uh, we primarily implemented uh, the HIS2 in uh, health, and currently we are moving forward to other domains uh, in some instances uh, in, the, yes, in water and sanitary, in agriculture and education. Uh, we are doing uh, research uh, field in uh, in the in these last years and we did two in the last two years uh, involving six provinces uh, four in the south and two in the north so that we could uh, evaluate uh, what's the stage and what need to be improved during this um, uh, implementation uh, we visit as well to 12 districts and several facilities. And what was uh, one of the major um, aspects that we found out during these uh, visits that we did was related with the data use. Uh, we noticed that data use, uh, data is being used uh, and this data, it comes from the HIS actually, but uh, what it's not being used uh, in, in uh, um, fully used is related with the analytics and dashboard. Uh, so I'm I move to the next slide where I find uh, I, I show some of the innovative process that we are finding during this project that we are uh, conducting at the moment. We found out that uh, uh, some of the practices that are being implemented by the ministry, like routine and statistical meetings and in different discussions. Uh, involving several actors uh, are indeed uh, helping or supporting this institutionalization of the of the HIS in Mozambique um, and other uh, aspects that uh, we found uh, uh, is that uh, actually this um, they have very much interest in using these uh, systems uh, in the in the daily routines and for instance we have seen in several meetings that they are using the data that comes from the HIS to monitor the the, the 
uh, activities from different facilities using indicators that uh, are based in their population. Uh, but this leads to an, one of the, uh, the aspects that actually is um, constraining somehow because uh, we, we have uh, data from the, the, the government that brings out the population at different, uh, in, from the different levels of the administrative levels. And we have this ambiguity on the, which population data we, we have to, to implement in, in that sense so that we can calculate properly the indicators that will help this management to, to happen uh, adequately. So, um, in, in that sense, most of uh, we still have uh, uh, in parallel. We, we 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 still have parallel systems uh, working on, in working with paper and Excel, uh, and then um, and also this comes with some technical issues that the users used to have in relation with the technical support that is provided. We, in, in, even though we have this capacity building happening, it's still uh, not enough to support all the teams that are uh, national wide. And we found out also uh, limitations are in relation with the HIS2 implementations related with um, the use itself. For instance, uh, uh, in terms of visualization, and that that uh, it's not uh, at that flexible and fit to the use cases in terms of functionalities that need to be there, such for instance the offline features that avail uh, helps the management manage, managers to to use the system while they are not uh, online. Uh, this question, this this issue in relation with the facility indicators. Uh, versus the facility po population that we have to, to deal with. Uh, and also some other issues that are related with customization in terms of dashboards and scorecards. Uh, we see that the people are using data and, and this data comes from the data storage that is the HIS, how it is being used now. And uh, they bring this data to other systems that they use in, uh, in parallel to make the outputs and this should be addressed in somehow. Uh, we see in this process different challenges. Uh, we have uh, teams that are working with development innovation, some teams that are working with support and capacity building, and we see also um, this involvement, these two, these two groups of, of people interact while they are in the field and getting evidence. So we are also thinking on how to bridge this uh, all these outcomes into the research, how to address these, and uh, perhaps using this uh, action research modus to move forward. And some reflections that we are um, coming up with are related with uh, how we can incorporate social approaches that uh, bring out this together, the, the social context and get it together with the, in relation with the technical design that the HIS has. Uh, following in the last years, and also how can we come up with uh, reducing these limitations, technical limitations, by going through the different apps that are being developed uh, in other countries that cannot can be integrated with um, with the HIS uh, as it is now, and we think that we can do this by involving master students and other PhD students in research and also these getting, in, getting involved also in support the teams that are in the field. So I rest and I thank you for the time and your attention. Jorn, I give it back to you, please. I will stop sharing. Very good, very good. Thank you very much. Uh, and now we move to India. Aruna. Yes, sir. I am just uh, sure. Go ahead, please. Yeah. Is it uh, visible? Yeah. Yes, yes. Clear and fine. Okay. Uh, thank you, Jan and everyone. So, uh, 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 so I present the uh, the research study we've done in India, 
uh, on one of the old DHS2 implementation states. So just to give a little over context, so this is where uh, so India started DHS2 much earlier than there was DHS2 uh, uh, available. So it was, uh, even when it was 1.3, that's where it started. So Orissa is one of the states which adopted DHS2 as the statewide system in uh, 2008. So, uh, so this uh, study that we've done in Orissa is in 2018-19. Uh, that's when we've done. So this is one of the DHS states where we've tried to, uh, the reason for doing this was to understand what are the sustainability qualifiers. Um, for these decentralized public health systems, you know, so what makes these systems work? What because it sustained itself for over 12 years on its own without any support from outside. So what is it that makes the system sustainable? So uh, and this is where Orissa is on the map, uh, and these are the partners involved in the study we did. Out of 30 districts, we took nine districts to work with closely. So the, there was Department of Health of the state of Odessa. Then there was the national, from the national level, we took the uh, National Health System Resource Center, which is one of the uh, think tanks at the national level to support the governments on health. And there's Hispindia, which is one of the HISP nodes in India. And uh, at, uh, IFI, uh, at UIO, uh, from the department, we had, uh, Anna, uh, who is there, uh, who's been an uh, active part of uh, the study. And, uh, and we had all our roles and contributions. Uh, so in the district level uh, study, we've just uh, talked to health workers, to uh, data entry staff, to managers of health, to uh, bureaucrats, uh, and also the IT staff, which is at odd level. So in a, a decentralized system, they're at the level is a health sub center where there's a health worker then coming above which is block which is uh, for about 50,000 population then there is just uh, then district uh, and then there's uh, uh, yeah, and then the state so that's the level and then we've done individual interviews we've had focus group discussions we've been part of observing people's work following demo in the meet Meetings. And of course, there's a whole lot of uh, secondary data, which was a lot of reports, uh, meetings, minutes, etc. So this has been our data sources. Uh, so after all, uh, for the research, getting the data together, so we identified five themes under which uh, we could, uh, which helped us analyze and understand uh, the findings emerging. So the themes we identified was one was the process of data validation, which also then tells us also about the institutionalization process of let's say DHIS2 in this. Then there's a process of capacity building, process of participation, process of data ownership and, uh, and local action and process of local practices. These processes, when I say these are what we are all I mean, just to go back to the research question, which is on our, on the sustainability qualifiers. So, uh, so, so this is uh, one of our meetings in the health sub center. Uh, this is this is what our health sub center looks like is uh, looks like. Where this is maybe one chair and a table, and then there is this common room where everyone's sitting on the floor to discuss. And this is the uh, the two health workers here. Uh, so for her, it was that, you know, the process of, uh, uh, let's say, the data validation. So it was not only just the data which gets reported. They had initiated the process that at the village level, the village owns the data which is being reported uh, for that village. So they had started a process of a village meeting every fourth where the health worker would bring in the data which she's going to be reporting upwards and discuss it with let's say they have a village health committee there uh, to make sure that whatever is data published from the village everyone owns it so i mean then to ask that is it not too much are you not uh, isn't it too much of data but then she says in a village either not more than five to six pregnant women at in a month and they and then not more than 10 children uh, who are there for vaccination so it's not like too much of data which they are having to discuss so the general uh, what we have in mind that there's just so much data how are they going to be working with so this is how this uh, and this was to understand the process of institutionalization then there was this process this process of capacity building which was that you know when this there's a data manager who knows DHS too, but then he gets transferred out or leaves the job. What happens to the next person? So they had on their own initiated a very 
testing process where uh, the new person who joins in at whatever level at the district, at the block, at the PHC is given formal informal hand-holding training uh, at the state, at the district, whichever is the level above uh, wherever he's posted. Uh, so, which was, you know, without any incentive from outside, but this is something which has been ongoing there for about 10, 12 years now. Uh, yeah, it's an institutionalized process. Then there was a process of what we identify as participation. And the examples for ex they should given us, there were the health the workers were having to report the same data in two different data sets. And uh, the health worker said that, you know, can't, why can't we just report the same data in one place rather than twice? And then they, it was their voice, which then they discussed in their uh, village and block level meetings. And then it went to the district guys, they discussed. And then from there in a state level meeting till, and the process was that, you know, they rationalized the forms that, you know, one data element gets reported only once. And so the health worker is not having to report it twice. So then there was, it did, given it was a system which was more flexible and it gave people space to make changes, which also then kept space for participation. It was not just like freezing, uh, frozen in one place. Uh, then we identified the uh, process of data ownership. So this is one of the block uh, person here. She, uh, she told that you know when she was looking at when she was to confirm the data and validating the data for uh, antenatal and IFN, she found uh, there was a data for uh, severe anemia cases, and she thought that it is something wrong. How why do we have severe anemia cases? And she thought in case it was a validation error, typo error, etc. When all was checked, having a meeting with the ushers, who's a community health worker, and ANM, which is the health worker that you know what's wrong and then to realize that there were actually cases of severe anemia who were tested and then the action there was that you know maybe the because when you start to have IFA tablets uh, the first reaction is constipation and then a lot of time women discontinue that and then here was Asha that started with okay in terms of mobilization as a community health worker she would ensure personally that you know the IFA tablets are given the woman eats has the IFA tablets right in front of Asha rather than you know keeping it away so that you know so that 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 was also that you know if, if it was severe anemia cases in my district so it's not about someone just changing the data just to make sure it doesn't look bad on the ground it was also taking ownership of what data it is and then action locally and then this is the health worker who ha who had a tab who had all kind of registers and forms which she had to fill in uh, there was a tablet which the government had given her to report and then she still of course, felt that the paper and her register was far more easier for her to manage. She could underline, she would mark, she could plot uh, uh, the paper uh, where, she, where she needs to come back to and allowed her to do much, many more things than just what a few, let's say a tab would do, what technologies allow me to do. Where, so, I mean, yeah, so this was uh, her viewpoint that, you know, whatever locally works is much better than rather than to give care, I should not be dependent on a tablet to show me the data. I mean, I should be able to do it in, in my own way. Yeah, and uh, then from the research outputs we've had is, so there's the report we've submitted to the government with findings which uh, for, the, for the policy uh, here. Then there's a report which was uh, uh, at UIO, which was submitted by Spindia, which was like what Yon's uh, heritage project is, the research project, which is to take the case study or what's going on with these uh, to understand sustainability qualifiers. So the, we've recently submitted one paper for IFA 2020 conference, which is on identifying the, uh, I mean, of course, the same research question or sustainability qualifiers. And the two research papers in pipeline. And then there is uh, for this course at UIO, uh, which Sandeep takes, which is on ICTs uh, for development. And then we would uh, developing the use or the case study uh, for the course. Uh, yeah, thank you. I hope I've not crossed my time limit. Thank you. I'll stop to share, Jan. Thank you very much, Saronima. And we move over to the Norwegians. Is it Ragnil or is it uh, Johan first? Anyway, one of them. No. Yes. yes. Just have your turn off the sound. Okay. 
Yes, so this is Johan uh, Sabo talking. I also have uh, Ragnhild Basso Gunnarsson uh, with me on this presentation. So our part of this uh, has a twofold motivation. First is to, to show also an example of research we do more of a, as an international consortium with various partners and to, to highlight uh, the empirical base based research uh, from Norway and Norway as a, as a case. So this, this project is a newly started research project looking at emergency response to the COVID-19 pandemic. And its, uh, its aim is to gather experience and support countries to respond to the situation we see now of very high uncertainty and rapidly changing information needs. Not just to improve uh, our community's ability to handle the COVID, uh, pandemic, of course, but also to learn how to do this um, with future disease outbreaks in mind. It's a consortium with many partners. We have the Norwegian Institute of Public Health, um, Eduardo Monlan University from Mozambique, Colombo University from Sri Lanka, Palestine National Institute of Public Health, University of Ghana, and then the University of Oslo here in Norway. And the primary empirical base are, of course, activities ongoing in these countries, but we will also draw, of course, on, on learnings from the wider community of DHS um, using countries. DHS is used for COVID-19 systems in four of the countries, Mozambique, Sri Lanka, Palestine, and Norway. And we also have Ghana as a partner uh, where we, we have the ability to also evaluate uh, another system, another technology in the SORMAS. So I'll, I'll leave uh, the word now open for uh, Ragnhild to present uh, some of the, the uh, ongoing work in Norway. Thank you, Johan. Uh, I am a fairly new PhD student with the Department of Informatics at UIO and together with other researchers. Are you able to unmute me? And, and present, Ragnhild? Can you not hear me? Yeah, you can hear me? Okay. You can hear me, oh, Johan, as can, well? I can just briefly go through this. Um, nice. So, uh, huh? in Norway, we also have uh, an established uh, disease surveillance system and it's been in place okay. for quite a long time. But it has been a, a manual uh, hmm? or using pen and paper. Uh, that's been the level of technology. And that has, has worked well for the kind of diseases. Hi, we can hear her. Uh, slow spreading, uh, huh? you know, uh, small scale outbreaks. Uh, typically things like, like uh, uh, intestinal uh, uh, diseases or it could be some cases of TB or something, but not much. So the, the challenge of course was this rapid spread of of COVID, uh, unprecedented scale. So, uh, right Hello? Minute. Hello, can you hear me? Oh, yeah, we can hear you now. Okay, super. Thank you, Yuan. Uh, I am a fairly new PhD student with the Department of Informatics at UAO, and together with other researchers, including master students, we study disease surveillance and response, uh, the contact tracing ecosystem, and the implementation of DHIS2 as the digitalization of contact tracing. So how does this digitalization affect both the contact tracing process in itself as well as all actors involved in the contact tracing process. Uh, in Norway, our municipalities, 356 in total, are responsible for contact tracing and the follow-up of infectious disease surveillance of their respective residents. Thus, the contact tracing process is decentralized. We have worked with disease surveillance in Norway for around 200 years, but have never but have very little experience with contact tracing of infectious diseases in the numbers we have seen these past months. Uh, during the weeks of March and April, 
The efforts to trace positive cases of COVID-19 was under severe pressure, as you all know. And to register COVID-19 cases, contact traces used pen and paper, and some after a while spread in spreadsheets. This approach was impossible to scale when the cases of COVID-19 increased. A joint force between some municipalities, the Norwegian Association of Local and Regional Authorities, the Norwegian Institute of Public Health, and University of Oslo was established. Norway has no previous history of using DHIS2, but during the spring of 2020, DHIS2 was introduced as a software as a service for municipalities. Today, approximately 100 municipalities are using DHIS2 for contract tracing. During a time with high uncertainty and rapidly changing information needs, the DHIS2 team has established routinely meetings with user representatives every fortnight, where they discuss user participation, user involvement, and user requirements. And this will be a part of our research. Thank you. Uh, over to you, uh, Johan or Jan. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. Um, yeah, sorry about that. We had some uh, we had some challenges here as we had to um, turn off the sound on all the laptops to avoid echo. Anyway, thank you for that, uh, Ragnhild. I'll continue yeah. with the presentation. Yeah, it was just one slide. If I'm able to go to the next, yeah. So the approach in this this uh, project is then to evaluate the system development cycles and provide feedback to various groups of, of, uh, of users. Um, the, the health staff uh, users, national team around both uh, disease surveillance and of uh, system administration, and the global developers of DHIS and the associated metadata for COVID. One thing we, we will do is to develop an evaluation protocol tailored for DHIS2 and COVID-19, which we will make publicly available. Uh, there are existing surveillance system evaluation frameworks, uh, but they typically focus on uh, other things, you know, the use and the val validity of the data, not so much about the evolution and the ability of the systems to respond to new changes. They also include assumptions that are, are not really uh, uh, relevant in, in our case, such as, um, as uh, corroborating the quality of data with other data sources. In many cases, there are no other good data sources for COVID. So hopefully the, this project is uh, leading to some, some knowledge that will be of short-term benefit for all countries in um, adopting systems for COVID-19, but also for longer term for improving uh, systems, um, making them resilient and responsible, uh, responsive for um, meeting new diseases. Thank you. Yeah, maybe I can just continue sharing my screen uh, to bring up the list of questions on the community of practice. And you can also use my laptop to go. Yeah, hello everybody. Then we have been listening to the, to the four presentation. And here we see there are some questions. Yeah, I see we have some questions already being answered in written by, by Anne here. We have some uh, questions to uh, Aprisa and Nilsa from Aung Kimin. Maybe you could go first, Aprisa, to respond to, to the questions coming up here. But Johan, we only see your screen with status. Okay, can I start answer? Okay, I'm going to read it. Hi, Aprisa, how many days do you averagely use for the capacity building training or a uh, training of trainer of specific project-based DHIS2 and what's the recommendation duration to conduct it? So um, 
I'm, I'm not speaking about recommendation here because we're uh, still in a trial phase, but our usually we in the rollout we train in three days, um, three days face to face training that's eight hours per day. But for this training, we're going to do it in three days also. But every day we are, we're training for 120 to 150 minutes. And then, and then between days, between, yeah, between session, we will have a couple days so that our participants will be able to do their assignments, for example. So the first training that we're going to do with the MOH is spread into one week with three days training and it will be around two to three hours. Hope that answers. Returning to you, Johan. Yeah, that's very good from, from the, from the, what do you call it? Uh, um, I'm sorry, you're leading. Uh, hi, hi, no. Uh, to yeah. interrupt again, um, if there's any, anyone who's interested in ab about capacity building, please just uh, drop me a message or anything in the COP. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, Tita. And uh, we have you, another Peter. question here. I can see for for Nilsa. Can you do you see it and can you answer? Hello. Yeah. Uh, do you do you hear me? We yeah. hear you. Uh, yeah. Sure. I I I just have a follow up question for Akriza. Yep. Go ahead. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, regarding uh, you have told us you know like about the uh, thank you for the uh for your experience sharing and as well as you know I would like to know the. The, the rules of assignment in the uh, training or trainer session and uh, yeah, what's the rules of uh, doing assignment, you know, like let the, let the participant doing the assignment work and, you know, like with or without assignment, would it, you know, like uh, have a difference? Thank you. Yeah, thank you for your comment. Um, so the idea behind assignment is to make sure that people, that we are able to monitor the competency of the people that we're training because because we cannot see them one by one then there are different ways we would like to measure the capacity or the competency that we would like them to achieve and this is achieved through different ways uh, like assignment is one of the example so for example we want them to be able to um, make data make data elements for example then the assignment would be like screenshot of the element that they have created and this is a proof that they are able to create that uh, data element but also we have other things like quizzes and then also we are following other things like a uh, discussion etc so yeah did that answer uh, yes thank you very much you're welcome okay. yes Jon, can i uh, proceed go ahead Nilsa. yes thank you um uh, the question is related how uh, how we are he's requested to share our experience on this transition from paper based to uh using dhs as a resource so indeed uh, we are still in the process but uh, we advanced somehow because uh, we we started by creating conditions in every district so that uh, at least every district uh, would have a computer and connection to the internet. So the ministry has managed to implement that uh, somewhere along the, 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 the way. So, so that in the, the, the reporting comes in paper uh, and, and uh, we have this uh, institution, instituted uh, nucleus of statistics which uh, we have uh, a team of one or two persons that re receive all this data that it's in paper based and introduces into the computer and sends it uh, with uh, internet to uh, which is uh, goes directly to the database that is in the Ministry of Health. Uh, but this was only possible now that we introduced DHS2 because previously we, 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 we had in, uh, initially very much uh, issues in this process because we used to do with uh, um, 
mobile uh, disks and uh, diskettes and, and other drives that we, we used before. But with DGS2, we, 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 the ministry created these conditions and we then uh, implemented this uh, system of collecting the, the, the paper-based information, uh, uh, put it in the computer and send it to the internet in every district of the country. Uh, and uh, for those districts that doesn't have, doesn't have these conditions, they gather uh, the information and go to the provincial uh, level or the, the, the district next to it so that everyone can report. And this is done monthly after those routine meetings that uh, I mentioned before and uh, after the statistic meetings that they have. So they collect the information, they prepare it, they validate with all the, the, the stakeholders involved in the district, they report it to the district, the district realizes, uh, organizes these meetings, discuss the data, and uh, this goes two ways, goes into DHIS, and uh, which goes directly to the ministry, and the other information is uh, discussed in terms of use, so that they can decide on approaches that the, this district can implement at the, themselves. So this is uh, still a process, uh, but somehow uh, we are trying to, to move forward with this. Uh, but I have here also two, two colleagues that maybe can add something to this process. Um, if, if not, I, I, I will hand it back to you, Jan. Fine, fine. Thank you, Nilsa. And there's a question here from uh, from uh, Maima to Arunima. How did Odisha government receive the findings of your research when you presented to them? Please, Arunima. Hi, Maima. Uh, how did they take it? I mean, um, I mean, they they were partners in the research, uh, uh, so they did come along uh, for uh, a lot of these interviews. Uh, the taking forward is, uh, I mean, they've uh, some places where we say, for example, on infrastructure upgradation, where we felt that, you know, there were outdated computers where it, some things needed, uh, it, it also added to evaluation, was they've added to their, uh, what do you call it, uh, PIPs, the annual plans. Some of it got added there. So uh, uh, the, uh, then there were the findings on in terms of, let's say, because they, I mean, there were these uh, rationalization process, but given that we, the process they had for rationalization of data were very interesting. So maybe we su suggested if they could also initiate a process of data integrity uh, audit, uh, so that to just see what, how much, of, just to check on redundancies, uh, what data is not needed, also to have a more, uh, institutionalized process of taking a uh, health worker's view on uh, redundant data which is getting collected. So that is on board, uh, so that they did take in. So there is a process of uh, data quality uh, integrate uh, audit which is in process. Uh, uh, so, so that's uh, there. Also then there was uh, 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 like one of another thing what we had recommended that uh, if they could institutionalize a way of uh, rather than like, I mean, this was once in 10 years process that we did, but something which could be, you know, more a uh, process of institutionalizing, uh, as, uh, if not an outside, uh, uh, in their own, not a review the way it's done with the meetings, but a process of uh, looking at what uh, data is getting, uh, as in research, as an institutional process. Towards that, they are then working with, there's a Institute of Public Health in Odessa, and then there is also Indian Institute of uh, Medical Research, which is there. So that's the partnership which has, uh, which was established in as part of this research. So now they are as two local partners in Odessa who are on board. And, uh, uh, you know, so the idea is that they should be able to make these interventions. So some of these are yes, where they could, which, does not cost too much money, but it was more on making partners and taking these steps that's been taken. But I think the larger ones, which in needed, uh, let's say, financial investments, so those decisions would be more pending. Yeah, does it answer your question, Mahima? Thank you, Aronima. 
uh, I think we are thrown out from this uh, space room or whatever it's called. Uh, you have one minute. Very, very, very <laughs> short time. One minute, you have 55. Okay, thank you all uh, presenters. And uh, I noticed one of the research questions in, in uh, Indo Indonesia where how to do field work and research uh, on Zoom or, or online. So that is something that we obviously have to improve on. So thank you everybody. And you can continue to post questions in that link that is shared. Thank you.